safe at home, we may have to face all sorts of emergency situations. In this program, we'll be talking about fire emergencies, medical emergencies, and environmental emergencies. Three out of four fires are caused by carelessness or negligence that could have easily been avoided. Emptying an ashtray into a waste paper basket, overloading the fuses. I know people who have an obsessive fear of fire. You don't have to have nightmares, but there are a few precautions to take. Check the batteries in your smoke detectors regularly. Learn how to use your fire extinguisher. When a fire breaks out, it's too late to read the instructions. Every time I hear a siren sound an alarm, I have a pang of anguish. Somewhere, a tragedy has occurred, and every second counts. In cities the world over, the fighting of fires mobilizes considerable resources. A fire is raging. The firemen are ready to intervene within seconds. They have been alerted by the regional fire center. They have already put on their suits made of synthetic fireproofing fibers. These supple but resilient fibers give firefighters great freedom of movement. These waterproof suits protect their bodies against temperatures as high as 300 degrees Celsius. They even allow for direct contact with live flames for 10 seconds. The visor helmet protects the firemen against impacts and falling burning materials. The engines that carry the firemen to the scene of the fire are more than simple troop carriers. They are veritable combat units. The automatic pumps are equipped with a reservoir and a powerful turbine activated by the vehicle's engine. The turbine pumps up to 8,000 liters of water a minute to six or eight exits to which hoses with fire nozzles are connected. Automatic pumps can provide several teams working concurrently with vast quantities of water under pressure. Other trucks carry the elevation equipment required by rescuers and firefighters working in high rises. Increasingly, these vehicles fitted with huge articulated or telescopic arms are replacing the traditional ladder fire engines. Fully extended, these arms can rise 50 meters high the equivalent of some 12 stories. They can lift in a nacelle, a water cannon and men, or be used for rescue work. Several safety devices protect the firemen during their work. A distress alerter, sensitive to movement, emits a high piercing sound if the fireman wearing it falls and remains motionless for more than 30 seconds. Portable detectors notify a fireman of the presence of toxic gases or smoke in the air he is breathing. A transmitter receiver keeps him in constant contact with the other members of his crew. At all times, firemen wear a lightweight respiratory device made of aluminum. The command post is set up in a specially equipped engine. It is the nerve center of the fight against the fire. In constant communication with the fire center, it is fitted with the latest communication tools. Cellular telephone, fax machine, radio transmitter. Moreover, microfiche readers enable the firefighters to immediately visualize all the water, gas, or electricity networks in the immediate vicinity of the fire. These data banks also indicate the possible presence of hazardous or poisonous substances in the burning building. With all this information, the crew bosses are able to assess the situation quickly, give their crews precise directions, and avoid having them take unnecessary risks. The materials used to fight the blaze depend on the nature of the fire. 
Water is the most commonly used extinguisher. It is poured over the fire, either in direct or diffused spurts, using nozzles held manually or with water cannons. Water extinguishes fire by cooling the fuel. Each type of fuel ignites at a specific temperature called the ignition point. For example, the ignition point of wood is around 500 degrees Celsius. If burning wood is cooled down to below its ignition point, the fire goes out. However, in more and more cases, water is not effective and is even dangerous. This applies, for instance, to chemical substance fires or those occurring in proximity to electrical facilities. To extinguish these kinds of fires, firemen use compounds that smother the flames, depriving the fire of oxygen. Foams, for instance, consist of a mixture of water and fireproofing foam substances, such as detergents. They are mostly used against inflammable liquid fires. Carbon dioxide, for its part, is used to combat fires in electrical facilities. Like foams, carbon dioxide works by covering the surface of the fuel on fire, thus preventing the oxygen in the air from reaching it. Firefighting is becoming increasingly complex. Ever bigger high-rises, new synthetic construction materials, and the proliferation of chemical products all pose potential new threats. To maintain their lead over this foe, the crews responsible for fighting it also will have to upgrade their equipment and techniques. Very often, it's the smoke that kills. Smoke contains carbon monoxide, a fatal gas. It consumes the oxygen in the air and replaces it with toxic gases like hydrogen cyanide. The combustion of certain synthetic materials, such as plastics, also produces poisonous gases. A house is much more dangerous than we think. Better to prevent than cure. But once the harm has been done, the only thing you can do is to call an ambulance. No one can ever tell when they will need emergency medical assistance. In order to respond as quickly as possible to such situations, a pre-hospital emergency network has been set up. This network services the whole of a city's territory. It enables the experts to send help quickly and manages the transportation of patients or injured people to the city's hospitals. You reach this network by dialing a three-digit telephone number. It links you to a central switchboard which receives all sorts of emergency calls for the police or fire departments, electric or natural gas services. The people who man these centers work with video display screens linked up to the telephone network. The screens automatically display where the call is coming from. As soon as they realize that the request is for medical assistance, they forward the call to another unit specifically designed to respond to medical emergencies. Here, 10 or 12 nurses work with one or two doctors. The nursing staff take the calls and try to assess their degree of emergency. The first thing the nurse does is to check the victim's address. She will then try to find out whether the victim's vital functions are endangered. Is he conscious? Is his respiratory tract open? Is he breathing? Is there a pulse beat? With these questions, the nurse quickly assesses the problem. She is then able to advise the victims or their relatives. If she feels immediate medical attention is required, she assigns an ambulance to the case and, in very serious cases, a medical car. 
Ambulances and medical cars are posted at strategic points throughout the region. The center communicates by radio with the vehicles closest to the scene of the emergency. When they arrive on the scene, the doctor and ambulance attendants intervene immediately on several levels. The medical car is equipped with about the same basic equipment as a hospital emergency ward. It carries supplies of drugs, surgical instruments, intubation material. However, in cases of cardiac arrest, the portable defibrillator monitor will be used. A heart defibrillator monitor can restore normal rhythm to a failing heart. The heart has its own internal electric stimulator. Roughly 70 times per minute, the cells of this natural stimulator at the top of the heart emit a nerve impulse. The impulse causes the heart's muscular fibers to contract in synchronization. This mechanism keeps the heart pumping for years. However, sometimes a clot in one of the arteries leading to the heart prevents blood from irrigating the heart muscle normally. An infarction occurs. In a crisis like this, the heart's internal stimulator may cease to emit regular impulses. When this happens, each of the muscular fibers in the heart begins contracting according to its own rhythm. Due to their uncoordinated contractions, the heart is no longer able to pump blood into the arteries. This particular condition is called fibrillation. When a heart fibrillates, there is very little time to act. After that time, the brain will suffer irreversible damage due to lack of oxygen. At the fibrillation stage, only the defibrillator monitor has a chance of restoring normal heart activity. The doctor applies the device's two electrodes to the victim's chest. The defibrillator's display screen shows the patient's electrocardiogram, which is the recording of the electrical activity of his heart. If it is a fibrillation, the doctor gives the patient one or several electrical discharges of a controlled intensity. These discharges cause all the chest muscles to contract, including the cardiac muscle. Often, they induce defibrillation. That is, they do succeed in restoring normal electrical and mechanical activity to the heart. These emergency procedures help save countless lives, but they could be improved through computers. Researchers are therefore developing a software training program for the medical people who take the calls. The program, called an expert system, encapsulates most of the medical knowledge in cardiology. The computer asks a series of questions concerning the patient's symptoms. In a fraction of a second, it provides a number of diagnostic hypotheses and suggests, when necessary, that an ambulance and physician be dispatched. Thanks to computer training and assistance, members of the medical profession will be able to respond more quickly for the greater benefit of people suddenly faced with an emergency situation. Your cupboards are probably full of cleansing products with threatening labels. Poison, inflammable, corrosive, avoid contact with skin, avoid inhaling, well, what should you do if by accident or distraction it should happen? Wash or not wash? Vomit or not vomit? Drink or not drink? How is it that our houses are filled with so many dangerous products? Did you know that most insecticides for indoor plants can be replaced by a simple mixture of soap and water? Moreover, all these toxic products wind up in our sewers degrading the environment. Of course, we could change our consumer polluter habits, it's one way of contributing to the environment emergency, but it has its limitations. During the past few decades, we have been dealing with new kinds of emergencies, environmental emergencies. It is no longer the health of an individual that is in jeopardy but that of an entire population. Saint-Basile-le-Grand, Canada, August 23, 1988. 
A serious fire broke out in a warehouse, housing large amounts of oil and solvents contaminated by polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. Clouds of toxic smoke lifted from the blaze and 3,000 people were immediately evacuated. The fire was soon put out, but the devastated warehouse, the debris of charred sheet metal, gutted barrels, and misshapen beams posed a real threat to people's health and the environment. And the ashes covering them were toxic. The ashes carried polychlorinated biphenyls together with dioxins and furans. These two highly toxic substances were caused by the combustion of the PCBs during the fire and would be dispersed over the whole region by the wind and water. The area had to be decontaminated. The cleanup was handled by teams of experts. First, the warehouse was surrounded by a canvas shelter. Within a safety limit set up around the warehouse, the workers put on protective suits and masks fitted with filtering cartridges. Each piece of debris found inside the building was meticulously treated. The contaminated oil in the damaged barrels was poured into new barrels. The empty barrels were then crushed and stored in airtight crates. The undamaged barrels were washed with special detergents and hosed down. They were placed inside larger barrels enclosed in containers filled with an absorbent material. The material provided protection in case of leakage. The warehouse also contained contaminated condensers and electric transformers. Like the oil barrels, they were all washed and put into containers into which absorbent particles were poured. Emulsifying solutions were used to decontaminate the building's metal structure. The solutions break down contaminated oils into tiny droplets, which can then be sprayed away with hoses. Once decontaminated, the pieces of metal were shipped away for recovery purposes. The last part of the building to be decontaminated was the cement floor. It was thoroughly hosed down. Plugs were also extracted to check the level of contamination of the cement. These various processes generated large amounts of contaminated water. From extinguishing the fire, washing the debris, the workers' showers and rainwater runoff, this water could not be released into the environment, but had to be recovered and treated. The treatment carried out on the spot by a mobile unit eliminated virtually all of the polychlorinated biphenyls, dioxins, and furans in the water. In all, it took 11 weeks to decontaminate the warehouse and make its immediate surroundings safe. While we still call them accidents, ecological catastrophes are often predictable. And yet thousands of tons of old tires are thrown into makeshift dumps every year. Should any of these dumps go up in flames, it would send off another environmental alarm. A newly developed technique, pyrolysis under vacuum, can transform millions of tons of old tires into reusable compounds without endangering the environment. Pyrolysis under vacuum is heating organic wastes, substances mainly composed of carbon and hydrogen in a reactor in the absence of oxygen. Under these conditions, the chains of carbon atoms break into small molecules. The molecules are then sucked up by a vacuum pump and are condensed upon exiting the reactor. This technology is capable of decomposing 100 kilograms of old tires into 57 kilograms of oil that can be sold to refineries, 33 kilograms of carbon black that can be used by rubber manufacturers, 7 kilograms of steel that can be used in foundries, and 3 kilograms of gas to fuel the reactor itself making it energy self-sufficient.
However, no recovery technology, no matter how effective, can prevent catastrophes from happening. Perhaps one way of keeping the hazardous tire dumps down might be to consign used tires like we consign soft drink containers. This approach would have a double advantage. It would mean money back to consumers and reduce the danger makeshift dump sites pose to us all. The more science and technology develop, the more serious the emergency situations they cause. And we always act too late once the catastrophe has happened. Yet common sense tells us that more than ever before, we ought to be trying to prevent them from happening. But our society continues to play with fire with a great deal of recklessness, exactly as if we took a lit match and threw it into a waste paper basket.